Yes. So, hello. My name is Andrew Slater. Um, my ma major is mechanical engineering. I'm a freshman from Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> we went to high school together. Um, anyways, so even though I grew up in Iowa, I was born in Missouri and uh, would most certainly consider Missouri a second home to me. I always love coming back to visit family because it means food and a lot of it. Um, not to say I don't get good food at home, I do. Not to brag, but I do. Um, but at family gatherings, I don't often have a lot to clean up. So I am the youngest of uh, two older sisters. Um, my mom is also the youngest of five older brothers. So I'm the youngest in like my generation on my mom's side and actually my dad's side too, um, apart from my cousin's children. So um, with those general introductions out of the way, I hope they can relate to at least one thing because I'm not expecting you to remember any of it. All right, so let's get, let's get this talk started. This is the E3 talk before Awakenings, which is super exciting. The E3 team asked me to share a little bit about Awakenings for those of you who are going on it this weekend. So to help ease some nerves and shed some light on what to expect. But since I'm going on Awakenings for the first time this weekend, I have no clue what it is, so I'm gonna <laughs> skip over that part. So I grew up Catholic. Um, while I don't consider myself a cradle Catholic, the faith has definitely held a significant, significant presence all my life. Side note, if you aren't familiar with the term cradle Catholic, it basically describes someone who's had the Catholic faith pressed on them by the parents all throughout childhood. While that person's personal faith may vary from person to person, they will often go through the motions of being a good Catholic for the main reason of that's just what's expected of them. There have been times when my family has forced me to go to Mass. That was mostly because I was just too young to stay home alone. My parents never forced the faith on me or my sisters, but we always went to Mass every Sunday. Something I'm grateful for is that they just acted as great role models. We always helped decorate the, for the various liturgical seasons, did the fish fries, and more. But basically, if there's something going on at the church, there's a very high chance you would see the Slaters there. Thus, during Lent, I always grew up giving up something. One more thing I need to share about my absolutely love chocolate. As a kid, my motto was, I like chocolate. <laughs> no joke, I had a shirt that said I love chocolate. I got it for Christmas one year. Um, I would often dig through the mini chocolate chips used for baking from the baking drawer because I just can't resist them. I finished mini bags. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact, Mitchell has a bag of chocolate chips in our room, and it's just evil. But I just pretend that they don't exist, so it's fine. <laughs> um, and any chocolate candies in the pantry would be gone in a few days, or hours. Mostly hours, and sometimes minutes. <laughs> so something I gave up frequently for Lent was chocolates or desserts. And I want you to try to imagine a little third grade Andrew trying to resist eating chocolate for 40 days. I cheated a lot. <laughs> so I know I said that my parents never forced me, forced the faith on me, which is true when it comes to me finding my own faith later. But that doesn't mean that I never dreaded going to Mass or the prayer services at school or the three-hour-long Easter Vigil Mass. They were never fun to go to in elementary or middle school. It was a factor of me being young, the services not being the most fun, and also just kind of like a little brat. Um, so, growing up, Lent was just an annoying season that required me to give up stuff I love, do so many extra things that I despised, and had to devote more time and energy into stuff I didn't really care about. Many of us have been told that the purpose of Lent is for fasting, adding prayer, and doing almsgiving. I know that I've been told this during every single Lenten season, but when I only focus on being a better Christian by fasting, praying, and volunteering more, it just kind of makes Lent suck. So you may think, whoa, Andrew, isn't that a little harsh? Like, aren't those good things? And you would be right in saying that. But remember, we're still talking about little Andrew. For the longest time, my perception of Lent has shaped how I feel about the whole season of spring. I associated spring with bleak weather, where the ground is always muddy, the temperature is still too cold to hang outside, and having long stretches of school without any breaks. But this all changed when I went into high school. 
I can specifically remember during Lent, my sophomore year, and that it just kind of clicked into place. My qu choir class was during sixth period, and there's lunch during that period. My friends and I would always rush as quick as we could to get to the lunch room so we could be first in line to get a good table, and especially on Cospito days. Oh, those are the best. Um, and while this was fun, and I really liked being at the front of the line, it, because it meant that I was guaranteed room to sit with my friends. However, as this you know, semester progressed, I began to realize that there was like a group of juniors and seniors that would kind of filter in after the line had gone down about 10 minutes into the lunch period. Um, and I was kind of confused for months and why they would consistently wait so long to get into the lunch line. And finally, I asked one of them. And they said that it was because they were at their chapel, chapel before lunch, because I went to a Catholic high school. My jaw at that point probably dropped. And I remember walking away from that conversation amazed, yet slightly jealous. That point was sometime around Thanksgiving. And after I tried it out and went to the chapel for about five minutes before lunch, it was nice. But as soon as I showed up in the lunchroom, I realized what I had given up. My seat was taken and I had to go sit off somewhere else, kind of by myself. So fast forward to Lent. I had tried to like make it a good Lent, give up something, like, you know, be a good Christian. Um, but it wasn't intentional or meaningful, and I didn't really end up doing much. I didn't go back to the chapel before lunch until Holy Week. On Monday of Holy Week, I saw the group walk in there, and I thought to myself, you've wasted this whole entire season of Lent. And my faith was going nowhere. That week, I went to the chapel before lunch every day. And it was absolutely worth not having a table to sit with, with all my friends. Because I found for the first time a quiet, perfect place for conversing with God. In that moment, I realized that even though I longed to be with my friends and sit at that cool table, God was calling me into a deeper relationship with him. And that relationship was developed and deepened over my junior and senior year, where I would always set aside time for lunch to have some quiet, reflective prayer with Jesus. So between retreats, religion classes, and my set time in the chapel, I kind of came to know about the importance of that and its general purpose. So now, before I go on to the second part of my talk, I want to take a little break. Use the next minute or two to reflect on what you know about Lent now and compare that to what little middle school or elementary you thought about Lent. And then once you silently reflected, share with your neighbor your thoughts. All right, let's bring it back now. So you may find that your neighbor had many, many similarities to your Lenten experience in your use, or maybe it was something different. I don't know. I didn't have a conversation with anybody. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, sometimes people do different things for Lent, or many times the rules of Lent seem unclear. And I want to briefly share a few of these rules, or rules for Lent. Um, so Lent begins on Ash Wednesday, which is in one week. Ash Wednesday is on Wednesday, next week, if you didn't know it was on Wednesday. Um, so Lent goes from goes until Easter Vigil ends on Saturday. Easter Sunday is the first day after Lent has ended. So in total, Ash Wednesday is 46 days before Easter Sunday, if you didn't know that. So there are six Sundays in between Ash Wednesday and Easter that are not included in Lent. So in answer to your question, that's probably going through your mind now. Yes, you can have your thing, whatever you give up, on Sunday. Um, and that is because that Sundays are a day of rest and a day of giving glory back to God the Father. Because on the seventh day of creation, God rested and he looked and admired how beautiful creation was and saw how good it was. And so we take a break from fasting on Sundays. So, but just be careful that when you allow yourself the thing back, that it helps you to glorify the Father. Binging social media and memes is probably not a good form of glorifying the Father. That is, unless they are Catholic memes. 
So yeah, Jesus cat has no interest in physics. Hey girl, I like to take you out for a small meal. That one combined with another small meal, it doesn't exceed your large meal. <laughs> Catholic pickup lines. Um, you done messed up, a a Ron. Buys a herd of pigs. Jesus casts the de devil into them. When your spiritual director asks you how you're doing after you've not seen you for a while, you just gotta have a bunch of knives stuck in you. I'm fine. It's fine. Everything is fine. Nothing is wrong. And it's not about control. It's about relationship with Jesus Christ. That one's a pretty funny one too. <laughs> <laughs> all right enough of that but doesn't that just make you just want to thank God like ah oh, so beautiful so anyways second Vatican Council 2 proclaimed two core focuses of Lent the first focus is baptism and the second focus is on penance and so baptism unites us with Jesus Christ. It incorporates us into his redemptive death on the cross, thereby freeing us from the power of sins and causing us to rise with him to a life without end. Baptism is the first sacrament for Christians to receive. It is such an integral part of our faith because it washes away the stain of original sin and opens the gates to communion with God in heaven. I learned a morality class in high school that the reason Jesus needed to be baptized was not to cleanse his own soul. It was necessary for Jesus to be baptized so that God could fulfill all righteousness. In baptism, our sins are washed by water. Thus, when Jesus was baptized, he is cleansing that water that our sins have tainted. In baptism, Jesus washes away our sins and puts them on himself so that the gates of heaven might be opened wide for us. Each year at Easter Vigil, catechumens are initiated into the Catholic Church. They enter into a loving and saving relationship with Jesus Christ and the Church. And also, the rest of our congregation is called each year to renew their baptismal promises. And so I want to just kind of go through them real quick. So, do you reject Satan? Yes, I do. In all his works? I do. In his empty promises? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Yeah, I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, and was buried, rose from the dead, and now seated at the right hand of the Father? Yeah, I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? Yeah, I do. And so... While these baptismal promises, although they seem kind of basic and obvious, especially if, like, if somebody who's grown up in the Catholic faith, but they are the very core of being initiated into the Catholic Church because they're similar to the creed that we say every Sunday, and it may seem monotonous to say it over and over and over again. But these words, these promises, are something that we make and renew every single year and every, even every single Sunday that we proclaim that these are the very core and foundation of our faith. So Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says that we were buried therefore with him by baptizing into death so that as Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And 2 Corinthians says, therefore as if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Our salvation cannot come without death. Jesus truly died on that cross so that we might be saved. By the waters of baptism, we are put to death so that the Holy Spirit, to make way for the Holy Spirit to bring us up from the waters in new life. So the next story after the baptism of Jesus in the Bible is that he fasted for 40 days in the desert without food or drink. Why 40? Well, 40 is a number associated with preparation. It, um, often people will spend 40 days preparing for a big event, preparing themselves mentally and spiritually. 
So the significance of the number 40. So the great flood was caused by raining for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses watered with the Israelites in the desert for 40 years. Whenever Moses went on the mountain to pray to God, it was for 40 days and 40 nights. The kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, all ruled for 40 years. 40 lashes was thought to kill a man, so often only 39 were administered. Israel served Philistines for 40 years. And Elijah fled around Mount Horeb for 40 days and 40 nights. So, as we see time and time and again, that 40 is a number of prep preparation and for reflection. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit for 40 days also, also to prepare himself for his public ministry. After then, knowing that Jesus was hungry, the devil tempted Jesus. However, Jesus was prepared. And not only did Jesus not give in to the devil's temptations, but the devil recognized Jesus' power and glory and did not even attempt to tempt him until way later in his ministry. So, I want to talk about penance. Lent is a time of preparation and penance. We do penance when we deny ourselves something that is suitable for us. Cutting out things that are extra is only practicing temperance. The Israelites complain time and again in the desert about God not giving them enough. God was giving them enough. He gave them the freedom to be able to love him. The Israelites gave up the comfort of a home, good food, and safety. But God's idea of how, those, how good those comforts were differed from the Israelites. Even though the Israelites believed that they had it better in Egypt, God's plan was better. We humans love to latch on to what is familiar. Like Peter in the boat, we have so many doubts about our future, but God calls us out to deepest waters. So why penance? Well, God asks us to give him the first fruits, not what is left over or extra. If Jesus is going to give up his life for us and suffer the whole way through, the least we could do is offer up penance to him. And there are two forms of penance I want to talk about, interior and social. So the catechism says that interior repentance is a radical re reorientation of our whole life, a return, a call to God with all our heart, an end to sin, a turning away from evil, with repugnance toward the evil action we have committed. At the same time, it entails the desire and resolution to change one's life, with hope in God's mercy and trust in the help of his grace. This conversion of heart is accompanied by pain and sadness, which the fathers called animi cruciatus and compuccio cordis, which is affliction of spirit and repentance of heart. And so, this interior penance, the catechism says, of the Christian can be expressed in many and various ways. Scripture and the Father insisted above all three forms, fasting, prayer, and almsgiving which express conversion in relation to oneself, to God, and to others. Along the radical purification brought about by baptism or martyrdom, they cite the meaning of obtaining forgiveness of sins. So interior repentance is accompanied by conversion. You may think that a person can only be converted once, and then they are done. Well, that's true. You can only get confirmed once into the Catholic faith. But Jesus calls our hearts to be converted to him all the time. We can all have little conversions of our hearts daily. These conversions happen in our daily life through reconciliation, through caring for the poor and vulnerable, and admitting our faults to our friends, letting our friends guide and help us, and actively changing our lives. Also through examinations of conscience, receiving spiritual direction, and accepting our suffering. I'm not saying in an order to be a good Christian, you must do all the things I just listed and more. But I am saying that these are what lead us to converting our whole life to Jesus Christ. If there is a time to convert our lives over to Jesus, it is during Lent. 
This conversion must start internally, but it needs to reach out socially. Our hearts must be fixed on Jesus, but as a community, as a family, new family, we are all called to change our hearts continually to Jesus. So currently, I'm in Exodus 90. Exodus 90 is a 90-day program focused on the main principles of Lent and following the, ex- the Israelites' exodus from slavery into freedom. And it takes having these conversions in daily life to the max. Exodus 90 has been a very influential aspect of my semester. Self-denial, fasting, and the increase of prayer has helped me to grow and be able to face adversity. Although the semester has been full of so many great new opportunities, I've had some trouble with friendships. But even though my mental space hasn't been 100% this semester, I continue to stay rooted in my faith. I'm almost afraid to even think about this pain had I not been strengthened by Exodus 90. And my brothers on this Exodus have also been very supportive. Having a holy hour most every day has helped me through my hardest times. Exodus 90 has helped build a solid foundation in Jesus Christ for me to stand upon. By rejecting my certain pleasures here and there, it has prepared me, and it still prepares me, for the harder trials and suffering yet to come. The result of focusing on baptism and penance is that your faith will grow. One of my Exodus 90 meditations pointed out a very interesting point about perseverance and growth. It is said that the common saying, God will never give us more than we can handle, could not be further from the truth. It talked about how even though Moses was afraid of speaking because of of his impediment, apparently I have one too, God provided Aaron to help. We shouldn't shy away from suffering and hardships. It is in those hardships that our faith can be tested and strengthened to unbind our hearts from the slavery of sin. We must convert our hearts to the sacred heart of Jesus. Taking up one's cross each day and following Jesus is the surest way to penance. Notice how how I didn't say the surest way to salvation because we have already been saved. All we need to do is accept that salvation by showing penance and sorrow for our sins. Because all the suffering that Jesus took was for us. A powerful image I heard from a Father Mike Smith's homily last year was that every time I cheat, every time I lie or slander at somebody or give in to temptations, I give Jesus another lashing and drive a nail deeper into his body. It was my sins that caused him to die on the cross. And it was for my sins that Jesus freely chose to suffer and die on the cross. So what does having a conversion of heart look like? Well, I can't answer that for you, but I will share you a guide to help. Typically, there are three actions that Catholics do during Lent. They are fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. We're called to fast during Lent. No, I don't mean Lent's going to go quickly or to rush through it. But fasting means that we only have one large normal-sized meal a day with two smaller meals. (laughs) Hence the meme earlier. Those smaller meals together should not equal the larger meal. Jesus was hungry, and so can we be as well. Hunger should remind us of the passion and suffering of Jesus on the cross for our sins. The Catholic Code of Canon Law requires fasting on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And so, as I said, it's one large meal and two smaller meals or snacks. That shouldn't even equal the larger meal. Also, meat is to be abstained on Ash Wednesday and, Good Fr- and every Friday during Lent. So the second aspect of Lent is about prayer. During Lent, we are called into reflection and spiritual growth. Lent allows us, and it gives us the ability, to be able to grow deeper in communion with Christ because of his ultimate sacrifice for us. Lent is a time to reflect on ourselves and ask God for spiritual growth. And the third aspect of Lent is almsgiving. In order to prepare our minds and bodies for Jesus' death and resurrection, we must also learn the values of almsgiving. Almsgiving is more than just putting putting money in the rice bowls and hopefully remembering to turn them in at the end of Lent. 
which we may have a few left over from previous years. Um, it is more than volunteering. But almsgiving doesn't end at, giving, at caring for God's creation. Under almsgiving, we give glory back to God for his sacrifice by going to daily mass when we can, attending stations of the cross weekly, and adding more spiritual exercises into our daily prayer. This Lent, don't just cut something out of your life that shouldn't be there anyways. Give up something to God. And when you do that, God will know how much you deeply cared about that thing. And he will accept that with joy, that knowing that you're giving it up and giving it to him. Then think of ways that your prayer life needs to grow. Maybe it's doing a nightly exam, doing daily Christian prayer, stopping in the chapel daily, or just some combination. But make sure to add time for prayer in conversation with God. And lastly, think about how you can give your life, give your gifts back to God. The point of almsgiving is to glorify God. Glorify God in caring for his creation by volunteering or attending Stations of the Cross weekly and or aiding others on their spiritual journey. When you're discerning your plans over Lent, don't let others discourage you. If you see someone going all out or somebody else being very strict in their own Lenten journey, please know that everyone has their own faith journey. Over the next week, ask God what he wants you to do for him for Lent. Take your plan to prayer and find it in your heart. And remember these three words, give, pray, and help. And even though Lent is serious and it's not meant to be sad and bleak occasion, it is really joyous because it ends in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Each year, you give us the joyous season when we prepare to celebrate the Paschal mystery with mind and heart renewed. You give us reverence to you, our Father, and of willing service to our neighbor. As we recall the great events that give us a new life in Christ, you bring to perfection with us the image of your Son. And I just thought that was such a beautiful phrase, and it's from the preface for the first Mass of Lent. So, thank you.